<laughs> Hello, welcome back to the Natural Awakening podcast with me, your host, Wiston, and returning guest, Roger Thisdell. Thisdell? Thisdell. Thisdell. One day I'll, I'll get your last name. Hasn't changed. Thisdell. Yep. He <laughs> continues to be Thisdell, yes. Uh, Unless uh, I get one of those, like, yeah, cool guru names sometime. Yeah, sure. I mean, hey, you can you can go take a refuge with with a, a teacher, and they'll they'll give you a Dharma name. Um, why not? Maybe one day. Um, if 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 you want one of those, I mean, Roger Roger uh, Thisdell. That's you know that's good enough. Um, yeah, yeah, I quite like my name. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, the purpose of our recording again is that we got a lot of audience questions that we weren't able to get to last time um, because. We had enough to talk about just between the two of us, and then we ran out of steam and time for the recording session. Um, so here we are again, um, running it back uh, in no particular order. Um, and uh, I'm kind of springing these on Roger. He hasn't heard these before, um, <laughs> and I haven't. I haven't looked at them since I wrote them down. So I don't. I, I don't actually know what we're going to talk about. Um, cool. Well, we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants here. Um, first one. Um, this is from uh, our, our mutual acquaintance, friend, colleague, Andres. Um, talk about the sense of solidity manifesting as a property of the axial aspect of perception. And then there's oh. a second part of the question, but maybe we can address that. Okay. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So the axial aspect is this term that I'm coining, and we'll see if it catches on or not. But it's to refer to essentially uh the aspect of experience that one has yet to see the emptiness of and appears to be one's uh perceived ground of being at that time and it's <clears throat> um very domineering but uh people don't have a lot of sensory clarity on it and so maybe it's hard for them to distinguish or point out and they can't yeah locate it any particular which way or maybe they can and uh it's really that that subject of being that is kind of everything in experience filters through or is perceived to be behind and one's axial aspects so i'm coming up with a new term for this because i want to help people uh find and relate to different parts of their experience independent of the specific content because the content of the axial aspect can change so one's perceived um ground of being or essence of uh being or experience could be you know for most people it's this sense of like the small self independent subject uh but then it can move along and it can become this sense of like the witness or this sense of boundless awareness or something like that or it could move on to a sense of nothingness or it could move on to uh just the sense of uh an experiencer and um it's solid in so much as the phenomenologically you aren't able to release it or dispel from it. i mean you might have temporary brief moments for but we're talking most of the time this just seems like your bedrock your foundation of being it's the the part you can't um peer through it's not phenomenologically uh transparent to you yet meaning you can't see through it it doesn't seem like an emergent property of experience yet it seems like no that's um that's ground zero um so it's it's solid in that way although many people might think it's um not solid if they were to relate to that part of their being. They want to make something special out of it. Often this is the part of their experience. They're saying is beyond all concepts and the world of form and this stuff. And uh, I would argue they're saying that because they don't have a lot of sensory clarity on what that part is yet. And they haven't really integrated it into the rest of the stuff. So they're making something special out of it. Um, yeah, do you, do you kind of get the gist of is, is that? Is that clear to you? Does that make yeah, that, you? That, that's clear to me. And I, I think if people are relatively familiar with the territory we're talking about, at least in a broad way, it'll also be, um, you know, 
it'll make sense to folks in the audience, but maybe I'll just restate it. Um, it's, it's that aspect of perception. Um, I've heard in, in some, uh, some contemporary teachers, I'm not sure if they're, they're translating a technical Tibetan term here. Um, if they are, I don't remember what it is. The basis of operation. It's kind of like the sense mm. of out of which you are yeah, like yeah. filtering, interpreting, acting from in your experience. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And I'm giving it, um, this ambiguous name to, so that people aren't always getting lost in, because if you call it like, yeah, your, your primordial self or essence, and then it's making it so special and people can actually be referring to different things there. And, uh, yeah, if you want to say, no, it's this special awareness thing or something like that. Um, yeah, there are some problems that come up and there's like a lack of clarity. So I'm kind of trying to ground it in, oh no, it's, it's, uh, relevant and relative to the other aspects of our experience, uh, including your sense of, uh, the focused attention and peripheral awareness and then this amodal perception. Yeah. Are you saying Roger, that we are not the absolute witness beyond space and time that is simultaneously present in every phenomenon? I may just be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't crucify me for it. <laughs> Are you saying that that's merely a, a stage uh, of development along, you know, a perceptual path of, of, of clarity? My goodness. Yeah. Well, this is the thing is I kind of, I want to help people understand, uh, have tools for better making sense of their experience and be able to understand where other people are coming from and uh, introducing a, yeah, a term here that helps make sense of why people might speak in a certain way and how you could relate that to your experience. And uh, if you're, if you're, if you've gone through that or you skipped it or you're before or after or any of these, which ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's clear for folks. And if it's not, you know, leave, leave a comment, <laughs> tell us, tell us if we're not make if we're not clear, because uh, we're, we're just talking yeah. to each other here. We, you know, <laughs> it's going to happen. Yep. <clears throat> and excuse the occasional cough that may come through. I'm uh, otherwise fine, but still got a bit of congestion coming off of a uh, common cold. <laughs> and then the second part of the question from Andres is, <laughs> and Jupiter, um, I assume the, the, the planet here being a huge unprocessed piece of information that gives the whole simulation a certain angular momentum that informs everything you perceive. I don't actually get what he's saying here. Do you, do you know what he's saying here? Is this a reference? I, yeah, I'm not getting it. Um, <laughs> So the, the full oh. thing is sense of solidity manifesting as a property of the axial aspect of perception, which we covered and Jupiter, huh? Being a huge unprocessed piece of information that gives the whole simulation, a certain <laughs> angular momentum that informs everything you perceive. I, I don't, I don't get that. I don't yeah. I, I think I can relate to what he's talking about. So just another point on the solidity part, this thing can actually be your axial aspect is so solid that you may not even understand it's solidity it may not be obvious it's not um solid in the sense of feeling a, a rock uh it it can be it's a a part of experience that's so domineering that it it's like a fish in water you can even forget that it's just all it seems like it's just always the case so you know when people talk about um they they they're always uh, aware of awareness or they um, have never lost touch with that sort of, that special, um, ultimate thing or whatever, or non thing thing. Uh, so I think Andreas is in his model of topological pockets of the EM field that we're bound to, you can imagine, um, okay, Jupiter, like a, a swirling orb and it has a uh an axis it's got like um is jupiter the one with this um like 250 year old storm it's got this it's massive like hur massive hurricane that's like many times the size of earth i believe yeah 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 so you can imagine if you've got sort of a swirling storm like that in your topological part which which all other uh, which affects the rotation of 
of, of all of the sort of vector fields and all the currents are sort of moving around it, then that's a pretty, um, that's like your axial aspect in that regard. I probably can't say much more. I want to say, yeah, I, think... I mean, that, that's, that's an evocative yeah. metaphor. Hmm. Yeah, so, so there would be something here to it's like calm the storm down and like unswirl the pattern or, um, you know, how do you, you know, reverse the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And so that it undoes that. Yeah. 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 And then, then you can have more, more Many uniform, ways. like, oh, sorry, say that again. No, no, no. How, how does one do that? And my, I answered my own question rhetorically yeah. many ways. Um, it's kind yeah. of mysterious, the actual mechanics of it. Hopefully we'll get some good science on this at some point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine without uh, a whirlwind um, in the middle of your being, then you can have much more uh, consistent like lateral flow throughout the experience rather than if anything interacts with that, then it gets sucked up and spat out. And, um... Yeah. 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 I think <laughs> that, 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 that's, that, that makes some sense to me. Um, not knowing much about, about Jupiter or, you know, maybe as much in detail about um, Andres's yeah, yeah. topological model, but yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we have cleared that um, from, this is from Naro. Um, what are your best gears level models of how various approaches methods work and whether some work better than others in relation to the goal of stable, um, which is an odd word to use, but stable non-dual perception. Mm, you've probably got a better take on this than me. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've, in my own practice, I've spent far too much time, um, examining different maps and models between mostly Bo Buddhist traditions, but also like comparative mystical study. Um, not as in depth as a lot of folks I know have done. Um, but it, I mean, my, my, my take, uh, I'm just going to ape Shinzen here. Um, I'm going to take, take a page from his book. Um, whatever works prag pragmatic criteria, um, for technique selection. Um, and if you find a map or a model motivating, great. Um, and if you find you're fixating on it, ditch it, just practice. <laughs> Um, mm. and, uh, like find, find a few good pragmatic, uh, criteria for, for progress, um, which is, you know, less resistance, less dukkha, you know, less suffering, um, less fixation in the body, in the mind, in perception generally, um, and just go all in on techniques that seem to work, um, and mm. do that in consultation with uh, a teacher or teachers or, and a community, if you can, for support, right? I mean, this is the tried and true way, um, that has worked for many hundreds and thousands, um, of, of people for thousands of years. Um, there isn't a magic bullet, I'm afraid. Um, not that I'm aware of, um, I've looked, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I have favorites, you know, among, among techniques and traditions and, and maps and models. Um, but that's just what's worked for me. It doesn't mean it will work necessarily as well, um, for other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think very much so. I don't, even value my own opinion uh, to a great degree on this question. I'm still sampling. I'm still hearing from more and more people all the time what works for them, what they like. And then I do think uh, the world could do with a lot more empirical research and data in this regard. You know, we're very far from any kind of yeah science of enlightenment, to quote Shinzen again. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't expect there'd be a, a, a one best method for all, uh, at all. Um, although we, there may actually be some methods though that we can quite conclusively say, yeah, that's not a great one for anyone even, you know, like you're not gonna, it's very unlikely you're going to get enlightened kicking a can down the road. I mean, it, you know, if you, if you're, if you're, uh, in the context of Zen Koan study and you've, uh, you know, been boring away at it for years and suddenly you kick a can down the road in frustration and the ting suddenly explodes your perception and you, you know, flip over, um, into, uh, Buddhahood, you know, great. Um, but yeah. uh, that, that, that you, you hear those stories and what's often left out, um, of these kind of spontaneous awakening stories, um, is, well, hold on, <laughs> there's a huge context that led up to that most often <laughs> in those stories that that practitioner that you know that that excerpt from their life they were practicing hard <laughs> for yeah. years or decades <laughs> yeah 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 
there's so much to fill in here. It's just like, what practices do people have an affinity for? Where is their starting base? And the, um, a set of practices or a school of thought might be good at one part of the path and then be less functional later on. And, and um, I think it'd be good to do some mapping on like attachment styles. And so, you know, people more aversive types or yeah, attached types, attached types and what works for them. Yeah, I think, it, um, yeah, there's just like a lot of research we could do there. Yeah. And some of this research, I mean, not in a, um, you know, randomized control trial sense, but some of this research um, in an anecdotal kind of yeah. embodied lineage wisdom kind of sense has already been done yes. um, within different Buddhist or other contemplative lineages <laughs> with, you know, kind of their personality typologies. Ah, you're a greed type. You're an aversive type. You, you're mm. inclined to dullness slash ignorance. These are the practices that would probably be best for you. Um, that, that kind of um, personality typology and differential recommendation of techniques you'll find in something like the Abhidhamma or the Vishuddhimagga, which is based on the Abhidhamma in the Theravada tradition. Um, and also that's just a guide, right? Um, my, my general, you know, in teaching, it's like, what do you actually want to practice really intensely? What are you motivated to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, maybe that's a, an unsatisfactory answer. Maybe, maybe one more thing. Um, in, in, in my, in my opinion, which is just my opinion, um, there isn't enough emphasis in contemporary contemplative pedagogy on cultivating really, really deep and continuous Samadhi. Um, whether that's through the jhanas or some other system, um, of, of sequenced states or just, you know, continuous cultivation of a really calm, clear, collected, focused mind. Um, you know, the, the Buddha, um, famously, uh, made the analogy of Shamatha and Vipassana being two wings of a bird. Um, you know what happens to a bird with only one wing? <laughs> you can um, imagine. Yeah. Um, and in, in Zen, for example, it's, it's frequently said, um, if you don't develop profound and continuous Samadhi prior to awakening, you'll definitely have to do it afterwards for integration. Um, mm. so um, yeah, I, I see a lot of people attempting techniques, um, kind of pitched at a level, which, um, traditionally, you know, would, would not necessarily require absolutely. Cause there are no absolute requirements, right? Um, you never know what will work. Um, but like as preliminary practices to those techniques, you'd want a foundation of, in some cases, like extreme Samadhi to, to actually make this kind of technique effective. Um, so that's, that's my take more, more Samadhi. I'm, I'm pro Samadhi, mm -hmm. pro concentration, absorption. Mm. And then, then, you know, the same, same vein, I think often people can overrate how much concentration they think they need, or that just being one of the wings, you know, I might add some other wings here where people think, oh, I just need more concentration. I just need more concentration. It's like, actually you could do with some more uh, overall equanimity or more sensory clarity or more like metacognition in this regard. And that's part of the reason you're not uh, punching through. So don't just brute force it with like more effort or actually your sub minds are really dispersed and um, combative against one another. You need to do some more Brahma Vihara practices or you need to go to therapy actually and resolve some of your trauma. And, and then you might find that you know, create some more unitive mind and then concentration gets easier just naturally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, maybe I remember someone else, uh, jumped in, um, with this question. So I'll, it's relevant. So I'll bring it in now. Um, what is your view on thought or thoughts on modern positive psychology? Um, it's a simple answer for me. Um, use whatever works you, you find contemporary psychotherapeutic, you know, modalities helpful. Um, as, as I have, and many of my friends, colleagues, teachers have absolutely do that. Um, Roger. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really what to say there. Um, modern psychology. Well, they said contemporary positive psychology, which I guess is kind of a, positive I, was, I was answering more generally yeah, in terms of like psychotherapy, psychotherapy. Um, I don't know specifically if they're referring to a school or a like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I have not read up enough on the psychological literature to know whether they may be referring to something specific. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a lot the uh, Western psychology actually has to contribute to this space and is making really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, help, helpful, helpful mappings of the human experience. So there's like the attachment types that I said earlier, um, you know, Jungian archetypal psychological work that does their understanding one's experience in like symbolic fashion, I think can be really illuminating and interesting and integrating your shadow. Um, I'm a big fan of IFS, internal family systems. It just makes sense when you go and explore and find these different sub minds that, you know, have uh, different voices or different parts of oneself that are like trapped at different uh, ages in the past. And you can kind of go back and, and hear them out and integrate them into sort of loving awareness. And it works really well in that regard. And um, it's nice. It's nice to hear. It's nice to see that more of the meditation community is taking on board these tools and looking into them because, you know, I think about spaces like radical non-duality scenes that are infamous for spiritual bypassing and such. And so they're like, oh, I'm just going to, I found this one safe haven kind of move trick in my mind. I'm just going to keep pulling it or keep attending to that or keep referencing it and I'll be good forever. And uh, yeah, it's like a, it's, it, uh, it shows itself. It doesn't do the trick. It doesn't relieve yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of deep tension and suffering. But, yeah. Um, a book yeah, so kind of I, I, there's some like, maturity and some development here. It's really nice. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, the, what the, I think is Wilbur originated this model, the wake up, clean up, grow up, show up. Maybe yeah. I got the order there wrong, but um, yeah. yeah. All, all are important, right? And, th and this is basically, it's, it's, it's not that this isn't covered in traditional, um, like, lineage teachings. It's just, you know, not within the frame of contemporary psychology. I mean, there is some stuff which genuinely isn't covered um, in the traditional texts and, and lineage stuff, mm. um, like, mm. um, like ma ma mature levels of psychological development, um, or mm -hmm. cognitive kind of sophistication, that kind of that mm -hmm. kind of explicit modeling is not so you won't find so much of that um, in traditional texts, but like certainly like the behavioral slash like ethical integration that is in the old texts. Um, and, and traditions and, and lineages, et cetera. Um, it's just, um, sadly often not emphasized, <laughs> um, for, for various historical reasons. Um, yeah. Any, uh, a book, a book recommendation, um, already free by Bruce Tift, who's a psychotherapist and also, a, I'm not sure if he teaches Dzogchen himself. Um, but he's yeah, he, good book worth reading on the, uh, um, interplay between contemporary psychotherapy and liberation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. This is from Christopher. Can a complex belief system take you closer to awakening or must all such things be ultimately seen through? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about this, about, uh, different types of intelligences. Uh, some that are useful and some that actually can hinder. There's something where, like, high IQ folks, folks they develop much more complicated structures of thinking that are then actually even harder to see through. <laughs> so they're just adding, like, more and more complexity into their world modeling, and they're not actually seeing through the emptiness, these things. Um, uh, and the, the, the question again? Yeah. Uh, can complex belief systems take you closer to awakening or must eventually all such things be seen through? Um, well, yeah. Um, ultimately I would say all of it's got to be seen through to be empty that, um, there's no, there isn't going to be any one-to-one -one accurate, uh, structuring mapping conceptualizing of reality in and of itself, uh, there's something to understanding that reality is perspectival. So you're just getting glimpses and they're always incomplete and partial. And, and uh, there's something to understanding that in the moment. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I, I do see some people struggle 
with some of this stuff because I think they're not able to adopt like sof enough sophistication in in the journey of being able to consider the bigger picture, be able to consider uh, long term and short term views and uh, beyond themselves, sort of picking up first person and third person perspectives and working with those. And so they don't know how to reconcile things like um, you're already awake, but also put in the work. And so that, you know, the mind is like splitting like yeah. this yeah. and depending on one's psychological level of development, people may be reduced to more black and white thinking, which can be hard and inadequate for them to um, get what's going on here. Uh, so it can help. It can hinder. Uh, yeah. What do you think? I think minimum viable scaffolding is my, my recommendation, but mm. most people will need some scaffolding. Um, and you know, that's, that's an ongoing discernment, right? Um, you know, some, some people, you know, in a Zen approach, you show up at a Zen monastery, you say, hello, Roshi, I would like to do koan study. And they're like, okay, um, you're going to extinguish all thoughts that you have cherished up to the present, uh, throw it all away, burn it. Um, here's Mu, uh, take this day and night, take it like an iron ball, put it, put it in your belly. It'll, it'll, and it'll, uh, it'll burn you up. Um, enjoy. Um, don't, don't give rise to any delusive thought. Quit it. Um, that's one approach. <laughs> mm. Um, uh, and for most people, most of the time, um, scaff scaffolding is good. Um, and actually, you know, if you're, if you're actually doing that kind of practice, there, there is that, that takes place within a greater context of mo yeah. motivation, bodhicitta. What are we doing this for? The liberation and benefit of all beings. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about there are some programs that are worth downloading to then later uninstall. I think about, um, yeah, certain steps here. So seeing that everything is in your mind, getting sort of like really getting on board and integrating, um, uh, what's it called? Um, indirect realism. And that's just a really useful tool, but at some point you want to see through that as well. To see through even the view that everything is in your mind. But if you can take that on for a time being, uh, but then also uh, dismantle it. Yeah. yeah, there's this wonderful, um, wonderful koan. There's a, some monks who hold a kind of naive idealist position um, that they picked up from Buddhist sutras and may, mm -hmm. probably their own practice experience as well. Um, and uh, the, a teacher walks by and sees them kind of having a philosophical discussion. And, and he, he points to a big boulder and he's like, monks, where is that boulder? And they're like, <laughs> well, of course it's in our minds. And it's, and, and he, and he says, my, it must be so difficult for you to walk around if with that boulder dragging around in your minds all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we could get into a discussion of different forms of, uh, you know, um, philosophical interpretation of, of awakening, but maybe, mm -hmm. maybe some other time. Um, mm, okay. Uh, from loopy loop, when you guys chat again, I would be interested on your take on this. Uh, so this is referencing an article, um, or a blog post, whatever that, uh, Daniel Ingram wrote. Um, and maybe we can come back to that. I can give you it in, in brief. Um, it's Daniel talking about, um, post MCTB fourth path, uh, perceptual shifts, um, including kind of a, a lessening of what he refers to in the article as uh, the attention wave. Um, so post, you know, fourth path, as, as he defines it, um, there was still the sense of like waves of attention, like moving throughout the field um, and kind of having a focal Ooh. emphasis or not. Um, and it, he did some practices that led to that eventually ceasing. Um, that uh, kind of dropped off more the sense of time and had kind of emotional and perceptual clarity benefits that didn't really improve the fundamental clarity about selflessness, but was nicer and has remained. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to ask him more specifically what he, what he means by that. I think I can do what might be talking about there. Um, I don't know if I, I totally relate for me, there's a sense that it, like attention moves through like a wormhole that connects all 
lots of experience. And so it's not so much as there's a, a traveling wave, it's just saliency okay. of phenomena and then the next thing and then whatever is. Yeah, I mean, a different, different <laughs> post, um, post kind of stable non-dual awareness. Let's just use that as a term. Um, you know, MCTV, fourth path. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll get some really divergent, you know, um, verbalizations from different practitioners and teachers about what comes after. Mm -hmm. And it's totally unclear to me whether there is radically different phenomenology that is being kind of, you know, <laughs> there, there's a big tree after, of development <laughs> with different paths afterwards, or, uh, people just haven't concurred on, on the languaging. Um, yeah. Because yeah. there just hasn't been enough in-depth discussion and, you know, in-depth phenomenological, uh, you know, investigation and clarification between, you know, practitioners um, at that yeah. at that stage. I, I mean, I can imagine, uh, you know, the sense of waves tracking with uh, slight somatic contractings as you move attention, and, and it's understandable that even at MCTP fourth path, there's still the neuronal connections that have been firing and wiring together over the course of a lifetime. And so, uh, there's, there's habits built up of when you look over there, that tense is something else in your body and, and, you know, it can take time to, um, un, unconnect those. Yeah. yeah there's, so there's, 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 there's every, every teacher of mine has, has told me repeatedly whenever I come to them with like, okay, this is what experience is like now. Or they're like, okay, that's nice. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think this is one of the, the cool things about that inflection point we're going to call MCD, the fourth path is, you know, the, the core elements of it is like no longer any sense of a doer, a watcher, um, no center, um, and just the, the completion of the emptiness journey scene, um, through and through. So there's no longer any aspects of experience that are, um, continue to be rendered phenomenologically solid or stable in that way. And then, um, I, I, you know, I really like how Daniel surmised kind of the core, core, uh, insights or attainments there. And then everything else after that, there's still so much, uh, variety in expression of this whole play Roma of things. And, you know, you can go into any which ways, like, like recently I've learned how to get into a state of animism, basically, you know, where the world is imbued with different spirits and such like that. And that has nothing to do with this enlightenment thing quote unquote, but it's just like cool now. And, and you develop so much more freedom of play in different mm -hmm. states you can access. And it's not really, the, the core of this is not really about any of those states really. Um, yeah. Although at the yeah. same time, I could say, nor is it not. But. Yeah. I mean, with, with there's, there's much more malleability of perception when the sense of a self drops out, that's for sure. Um, and you know, it's up to the practitioner and, their priorities, discernment, what they find useful, interesting, enjoyable, past that point to discern, you know, okay, the mind is now in this very malleable state um, at baseline. What do? <laughs> um, I have my preferences, but th those are those are my preferences and my priorities. <laughs> um, animism, neat. I've had I've had some experiences like that. Um, Mostly, mostly my explorations continue to be in the kind of Vajrayana Dzogchen end of, end of things. And that can mm. get pretty weird and exotic in fun ways, um, which, mm. um, yeah, well, I mean, read, read the texts, folks. It's not an exaggeration. Um, gets weird. <laughs> gets fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Reality can get really freaky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, really free. I mean, we really freaky. I don't know. I mean, it's well, just, it's, it's relative. So I, I mean, relative to the, the norm and the norm suppose, is also yeah. relative to, um, the geographical location of the, you know, how people, what kind of minds people typically have at this point of history as well. So you, you can true. imagine you know, other points in history or other cultures or places where, 
um, they just exist at very uh, what would we consider radically different altered states of mind. That's right. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, my, 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 my normal meter is kind of broken at this point. Um, so, <laughs> um, I managed to get out the door with my pants on. That's good. Um, That's good. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> right way around fly up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, from Ethan. Hypotheses about the mechanics by which practice, long-term practice, increases intelligence, which mental skills and such are most able to be affected, what this means about the nature of intelligence, how this works in, conjun in conjunction with valence changes, etc. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. And it's so anecdotal, but I want to say, yeah, my potential for realized how smart I can be was absolutely bolstered by all this meditation practice. It's something to, I just have more mastery over my mind and attention and more uh, getting less caught in the hangups and being able to let them go. There's something to, I think I can, I've managed to access higher stages of psychological development because one thing MCTV Fourth Path got me to was having a kind of mind that is effectively ontologically neutral and can get out of the reductionistic game where it's not trying to pin down and close and contract around any particular, you know, ontology or metaphysical belief. And so there's radically more freedom to uh, entertain and consider loads of um, more points of view or perspectives. Um, meditation has uh increased my theory of mind ability so it's it's quite rare that there's a mental state that people are talking about that i don't understand at least somewhat how that could be or where they're coming from what it's like to experience that from their side and then the mental states give rise to um yeah their belief propositions and their values and such like that so there's just more accessibility in that regard um so these are anecdotal points i would say meditation has uh i don't know about made me smarter but certainly helped me reach uh more of my my, my latent um, intelligent abilities um although you know on the flip side i have found there's been times where i was spending a l many hours a day in highly de-reified like absorption states, jhanas and such like this, or going towards an eroda summer party. And, and I think that was having an effect on my like mid-range memory. I was like, my memory recall was less good because I was just like so spaced out all the time. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, I wasn't yeah. matching onto anything. Um, so there could be drawbacks there. Um, but you know, all of this is very anecdotal. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, same. I mean, uh, basically, I agree with everything you said there. Um, mm, the only thing I would add is that um, one one interesting fact that has been fun and interesting and useful um, is that my capacity to visualize is much, much like orders of magnitude better than it was when I started. Um, and partially, that's just yeah. a function of the kind of training that I'm, I'm doing these days, which is which is in, you know, Surprise, surprise, if you do a bunch of visualization practice, which, you know, is in Vajrayana, you get better at it. Um, and also just a baseline of, of, of Samadhi and clarity, of course, that, yeah, the, you're going to be better at those kinds of, yeah. um, you're good at defabricating. Funny enough, you, you can, you're, you, you, you end up being better at fabricating different um, states of mind, right? Yeah, for sure. I think also, uh, you know, with heightened noticings per second and sensory clarity, uh, more information is more intelligible to me, more readily um, available to be understood. And so my, my mind works faster at a higher fidelity because of this kind of um, intensive training. Um, and there's something to also not engaging in, you know, the way I think now is not, so much, not not entirely not, but so much with just that having to um, 
track information where it's risen to like linear linguistic thought streams. Mm -hmm. And so I'm catching kind of the bulk of the, the meaning before it has to, before it's being displayed at that level, which is actually quite slow. If you're having to hear in your own, uh, head mind, the thoughts sort of spelled out one after another, there's something to, no, no, that is, uh, are just a, a voicing and reflection of like deeper structures that now you've made that were previously unconscious. You made them conscious that contained like they're like hyper objects with a lot of imbued meaning and they're accessible. So there's something interesting where I'm, I, I can just think in a more complex fashion, I think bigger as well. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. You can, you can hold a, a larger array of, of complicated, fabricated mental objects, uh, simultaneously, and you don't have to have a recourse to more sequential serial processing that, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah something like that. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So further research required, all of this is just <laughs> data. Um, uh, this is from Nick Camarada. Um, Hmm. Let me see. Let's, let's close on this, this, this question. Um, okay. One more, and then we'll get to the, the this final one. Um, what esoteric okay. places, this is, this is from faint. Um, what esoteric places has Roger found similar phenomenological reports to his own experiences? I, I think I need a little bit more. Uh, yeah, that's really, really general. In the blanks. Can you, can you draw something from that? Um, I don't know, uh, in my own phenomenology, um, I do Vajrayana practices. I have Vajrayana experiences. Again, there's not, I used to think that there was some exaggeration in the texts. Um, nope. <laughs> it's esoteric. It's weird. Um, by conventional standards. Um, uh, I don't know what more to say about that. Um, yeah, I, um, just maybe not the most informed here. I mean, there is, you know, the, there are these cliches of you know, yeah, reading esoteric texts and they become more relatable. You know, the, the more you practice or go along on the, on this journey and, uh, you know, a lot of it, you get a sense of, oh, that's what they're speaking to, or that's conceivably what they're speaking about. I'm trying to think of specifics here. I mean, stuff about like animism and such like that, for example, and, um, I don't know. Nothing's coming up. Nothing. Yeah, that's fine. Um, there's a second part to the question, however, from the, the same individual, um, which is more specific. Um, seeing the Jhana discourse, if you have, I don't know if you've, if you've paid attention in, in, at all to the, the Jhana drama on mm -hmm. Twitter, um, <laughs> and the, the general lineage teachings um, held by experience commentary. So this is kind of contemporary it's stuff that's been dust ups on Twitter, people being like, we, lineage is necessary. No lineage. It's all DIY. You know, people arguing back and forth. Um, do you feel um, any of the steps on your path should have been held more in lineage? Um, like, would you have benefited in any way from like practicing in a container of, you know, a, a tradition um, with, with a, a teacher, a guide, et cetera? Um, maybe. Yeah. Quite, quite likely. Yeah. My, my journey was very solo, just in my bedroom kind of figuring this stuff out I won't deny that it could have been beneficial for me to have found uh, a good teacher that was a good fitting for me and allowed me to speak very openly about my experiences. And, uh, um, you know, I'm still very much open to that. I'm still very open to, to learning from the greats who've come before me, who have a lot more experience and, and wisdom. Um, yeah, maybe there's something about my my kind of personality or disposition that uh, was whenever I was going on retreats or um, a lot of these sort of character teachers weren't speaking to me or calling to me or there wasn't a sense that I could do the nitty gritty phenomenological discernment stuff that I was more drawn towards or that that would have been uh, encouraged or recognized even. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I can, I can relate for the first five years of my practice. Um, I, though I was practicing in monasteries and lineage contexts, um, it was rare that I, um, discussed the intimate details of my practice with a teacher. Um, you know, sometimes I would have a specific question about a specific thing or a technique, but mostly, mostly I was working out of, you know, technical manuals, um, and occasionally talking to senior, uh, friends more than teachers. Um, uh, but you know, in recent years, I, I have found teachers that, you know, are willing to just, you know, (laughs) they're good with whatever I bring, which is great. Um, (laughs) uh, and that's, 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 unfortunately rare. Um, well, is, is it unfortunately rare or have I just, you know, I don't know for, in my own case, it was a mixture of kind of, um, mm, yeah. Uh, DIY spirit pride, um, overestimation of my own capacities <laughs> and also, you know, not finding teachers that I really wanted to work with until later. So, mm. I, I do think there is something nice about the, or something powerful even about that strong having a strong fortitude and solo willing effort like by damned i'm gonna i'm gonna get this myself and no one else can do it for me anyway and so and just uh yeah having a confidence that you know well i have to look at my mind no one else can look at my mind i'm here i'm here to do it um uh yeah fortunately sort of navigating that space but i don't have strong opinions about this i much i'm so much of a I just take things in context and it depends upon where people are at and their dispositions, their personality types, their fittings, you know, what um, might work for them at that time and place. And, and all that is up in the air and can change. So. Yeah. I mean, as, as usual, um, sorry, folks, it depends. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I also don't have, very strong opinions. I'm, I'm, I'm more traditional and conservative, I think, than many of my, my friends and colleagues in kind of the pragmatic Dharma space, um, in some respects. And also, uh, you don't, you don't need a teacher. You can, you can, you can traverse the whole path just from, um, meditation manuals. Um, and also it, you know, if we're just playing the odds, it's good to check in with, (laughs) with, with, with someone with a, a lot more experience sometimes at least. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to get into cul-de-sacs, dead ends, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. make, make a lot of classic mistakes, um, and not realize you're doing it till some time later when, you know, someone further along could have just said, Hey, you're doing this. Um, you know, I did this. You, you don't have to do this. You could turn this way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think this is where, a, like a tenant of radical honesty with oneself is, is just like a must. I mean, really just be so clear with yourself that, you know, committed to not BSing yourself. How free from dukkha do you feel? You know, and, uh, and always, yeah, just keep looking, keep prodding, keep, keep, uh, practicing. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, okay. Coming to the, the last and perhaps the most controversial subject. Oh. Um, this is from Nick. Th- this is from Nick Camarada. Most of my questions revolve around the everything is suffering, just a different extents idea. Um, I'm pro truth, <laughs> even if it's harsh, but this feels like an extremely expensive in terms of stability, well-being, etc. meme to propagate widely. If it turns out not to be a hundred percent, right. So there's, there's, there's a bunch bundled up into this question. Um, uh, kind of an info hazard, um, or like mm. precautionary principle. Like if, if all fabricated perception is suffering, um, is that actually true? And if, if, if it is, is that really something that we want to be telling people? Um, because it, it might just, you know, make them unhappy or lead them into a kind of nihilism, which is a genuine danger. I mean, you'll find, um, in, uh, the Buddhist text, actually, um, people who, um, the, the teachings are considered a, a snake. Um, if you, there's a right way to, there's a right way and a wrong way to grasp a snake. If you grasp the snake the wrong way, it's going to bite you and you might die. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's the analogy from the early texts. And there are records of people hearing the Buddha speak one time, um, n- not understanding it in context. And then they, they go and do something horrible. In some cases they take their own lives. Um, that, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, which we definitely want to avoid and not promote or anything like that. Um, yeah, there's, <sighs> I think of a lot of these teachings as they're not 
ultimate dictums of what exactly is the case, they're like counterforce teachings. So uh, maybe in the grand scheme of things, we're trying to find the middle way. So there's this balancing act of um, most people are so confused about the nature of pleasure and suffering. And so um, Buddhism on its front seems kind of pessimistic, but um, in the right circumstances, it can get people to actually question, well, actually, all these things that I thought I was were, should be attached to and are, are good in and of themselves and are pleasurable, uh, it was like, oh, no, even those contain dukkha, or oh, let me inspect those, or oh, hang on, they don't provide me satisfaction. Uh, okay, that can be a good counterforce teaching. I think about, yeah, um, Nirvana being talked about as in some, there's like a negative view that it's the complete annihilation of all fabrication form and, and suffering. But there's other descriptions of it where it's talked about as being the supreme bliss, the like pleasure beyond pleasure. And it's talked about in these like really positive terms. And there's a way to make sense of both of those. Like, oh yeah. Uh, and I would, you know, something if, if, I mean, this is a bit more advanced, but if people can have cessations and gain knowledge into the insight of Nirvana or Nibbana, um, can you do the kind of contemplation to make sense of both of those descriptions and see how, yeah, they're, they're both, they're both accurate in a way they can be pointing towards the same thing. Uh, is that I do understand the information hazard of talking in a way that of all of this being so negative, which I'm I'm guilty of. <laughs> I know, uh, and I, I'm trying to just like apply this counterforce teaching. Um, it's a big topic, and it's something worth actually exploring delicately. Because I I've had have had people write to me, actually being like, yeah, I've heard what you said about there's no such thing as pleasure, and it's like suffering all the way down. And so why isn't death just preferable in this way? And I'm not, I'm not advocating for that. There's something to, um, you know, that, that being a tool to let people ungrip and let go, but eventually this, you know, with the other teachings, with the no self insight as well, this can lead to a scary place of like, well, actually you can't die. Um, if there's no one here, it's just like consciousness, consciousness re-manifesting. And so you don't get to solve the problem of suffering by, by dying and such. Uh, and then there's also the, the universe is doing its thing. This is, this is all part of it. Uh, we still want to minimize suffering, mitigate suffering. Um, but, there's something to uh, getting to a place where it's it's yeah, I mean it's just so manageable it's so bearable it's so acceptable in this way I mean for, for oneself at least because the suffering is so so minimal and this this goes on and there's a continued burning off of one's karma and helping off of people's and um yeah, big topic. Uh, does it raise thoughts with you? Yeah, um, I would. I suppose I would just agree with everything you've said so far, um, and add um, there are more positive valuations, right, and descriptions of the the path and the goal um, in later Buddhist traditions or other contemplative traditions. You know, which, as far as I can tell, approach similar, if not the same, territory. Um, that you know, one, there's one description of Nirvana or Nibbana as a mind freed from greed, hatred, and delusion, right? So just the, the absence of those factors oper operating in the mind. Greed, you know, you could translate it also as attraction, um, as this, you know, pulling towards this, 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 which, and all of these depend on the sense of a separate subject. There's this need, this pulling in of, of something outside oneself that, you know, the boundary between self and other still being maintained. 
I need something, something, anyone, anything. <laughs> um, then there's the, the, the push, right? The, the aversion, um, like, oh God, not this sensation, not this, not whatever mm -hmm. this thought, this emotion, this feeling, this situation, please fuck no. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. pushing away. And both of those depend necessarily on, um, the sense of a separate subject or the traces laid down by that separate sense of self. Um, you know, because ha all habits don't evaporate at awakening. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Further, further practice required. Um, and and then there's the the delusion that that undergirds both, right? The the ignorance. I mean, these are these are the three root like mula kleshas um, in in Buddhism. The root delusions, um, the root defilements, afflictions, various translations, um, and the ignorance which undergirds both is the ignorance of emptiness, the delusion of a separate self that there's a bearer of suffering, right? So if, mm -hmm. if, if the, if the sense of a, of one who suffers is gone completely and not just, not just internally, I mean, this is sometimes odd to talk about, but whatever, um, the sense of anyone beyond oneself as a separate entity suffering also goes, mm -hmm. you know, there isn't the sense of there are, there are individuated subjects outside of oneself who are the real owners, the possessors, the bearers of suffering. There's just valence, mm. right? Um, manifesting in different forms, expressions, etc. Um, and that takes the sting out um, in a indescribable way. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. This is this is a point where I mean, it's a uh at a certain point yeah the will to be and the will to not be stop making sense they don't they don't land on anything anymore they can't be uh located onto any one being to to speak for the whole about it's better to live or to die or whatever just but for people who are not there though i mean one thing i would like to express is for people to um take their own experience very seriously really examine your own experience so what do you think the relationship is uh, what does one perceive the relationship to be between pleasure and suffering and, and experience and, and and searching around and um with you know unless so just hearing what one set one someone else says and then taking that okay well roger says okay, everything is suffering okay now i'm going to believe him oh, keep keep looking in your own experience keep finding um and you'll find you'll find things that you do do delight in yeah the, the, yeah it, with with all of this it's it's best you know pragmatically not to treat these as like ontological metaphysical um claims about the nature of reality Th these are these are phenomenological pointers right if you if it's a view in, in robert bea's sense it's a way of looking mm -hmm. right? yeah if, if you view all fabrication as dukkha as unsatisfactory what does that what effect does that have on on the chitta on the on the mind on the heart on the on the perception <laughs> the tendency with you know viewing everything as dukkha is less clinging right and less clinging mm -hmm. equals less suffering <laughs> yeah yeah and and you know the, the other half of this which may seem paradoxical is my life is infinitely better having having gone through this and really examined this and then uh yeah, I do point to this kind of teaching of understanding everything as containing an element of negative valence. And yet the quality of my life is radically better than when I was actually more deluded about that. When there was still this, uh, these vestiges looking for a sense of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. in things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the classic Buddhist response is like, well, um, let's not make it ontological, just phenomenologically. Um, if you are always seeking satisfaction in things, in transient phenomena that are born of causes and conditions, they will break apart. There is no refuge there. Um, and any, any possession you have, any relationship you form, any um, accomplishment or recognition or wealth you attain, it will, it will leave you at, at the very least at, at, at death. Um, and then what are you left with? Um, there, there, there is no lasting satisfaction to be found in, in passing phenomena. Um, no, no secure satisfaction. Um, not that there isn't 
any satisfaction, because obviously there is. Otherwise, we wouldn't engage with sex, food, money, power, whatever. Um, but they're, they fall, you know, unspeakably short of the freedom and happiness that is possible. Amen, brother. All right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we're done. Um, cool. Yeah. I, I think we're good. I think we're good. Um, any, good. any final words? Um, bless <clears throat> me all and do well unto yourself as you would to others and vice versa and all that good stuff. So. Yeah. May all beings everywhere be released from all suffering without exception. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will put links to Roger's things um in the description um where i mean people can just google you you're you're, you're very findable great or uh, maybe too findable <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> keep myself on the on the down low you know <laughs> i want the right um, people find me um i you know i i also have a website i'm i'm teaching full-time these days if you're interested in that you can you can find me i'll put a link to my stuff um yeah okay Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks, Roger, for, for coming on again. And uh, thank you. Take care. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>